all these epitaxes. So then that's that. The next slide deck is probably much, much faster because this is more the So this is the diffusion. I think, I mean, don't, 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 don't quote me on this, but I'm not going to go into great detail. There's a number of slides here, 33 slides, but you're, you're being challenged right now with your take home double diffusion problems. So I think I'll let this kind of stand on its own. Um, you have enough to wrestle with there, so to, to uh, hammer you with that again on the 3030. I have enough testable material, so I'll be honest with you straight up that I'm probably not going to touch upon this. Okay. And then somewhat the same goes with the beginning of this. What I want you to know here is that the oxidation, no I don't, it didn't work before because I don't have uh, administrative privileges. So the oxidation, all I need you to know from the oxidation is what we talked about earlier. That, it's that, ver that the interface is virgin and that we're probably going to prefer to use the 100 substrate and so therefore this dry oxidation that we're going to do for the gate uh, dielectric, that's going to be really nice with that nice clean interface. And then if we were to come in with the wet, we're going to be able to do the isolation from one transistor to the other. Yes? Could you explain why 100 is the best to use for that? You would have to go through the, uh, ca uh, calculate from the different uh, zinc blend what the uh, uh, planar densities are. Usually higher order planes like 111s are much, much denser. So that's why when you cleave a diamond and things like that, it's certain certain directions that it's cleaving along. Uh, but the 111 is definitely more dense. But if you just go through the calculation of the planar densities, 100, 111, 1, uh, 110, there's even more exotic ones. There's 311s, there's 511s. Uh, but 100 is one of the more benign uh, directions. So that means it can allow for more things to oxidize on it? Um, no, it's the, no, it's the least density, so therefore least it's the density. least number of, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is that idea, the key interface is ultra clean, never having been exposed to the outside world. That's your main takeaway from the oxidation. Um, okay, then we get into the quantum mechanics. Okay. So like I said, maybe I have you design a, where is it? I guess I don't have it. Uh, particle in a box, you know, sort of. Uh, let's just, yeah, well, let's use this one then. So you have a, a particle in a box, and what, what are the wavelengths? You've got a fundamental, you've got a first harmonic, a second harmonic, and so forth. Uh, and that you may have done in physics, e and um, uh, then, But understand that things tunnel, so quantum mechanical tunneling happens if things are uh, atomically thin. And so if I bring two atoms together, understanding that the placement of those atoms is fixed, the direction, because of the, the directionality of the covalent bond, uh, the distance due to the, uh, the constituents that they are, there's this preferred atomic interatomic spacing, and that will lead to the forbidden energy gap. And the reason there's a variation in energy gaps is because there's a variation in interatomic spacings. So, you start off with the idea of the single atom with its 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s. You smush it together. You smush two of these guys together, and they start the 1s states start to overlap each other. 
The two S states start to overlap, and they can't occupy the same quantum number because of what? Huh? Paul exclusion. Paul exclusion principle? Go another gold star. So Paul exclusion principle. And so the splitting here of the energy levels, and therefore one goes up, one goes down, like the uh, the, the, the nasty earthquake in Indonesia. What was it? 7.5? So I, you know, I was fortunate to give a lecture in uh, Indonesia many years ago. Very nice place. Um, but uh, uh, but the plates, you know, plate tectonics cannot occupy the same volume of space, and the energy levels cannot occupy the same uh, space of energy. So one goes up, one goes down. There's a, in this case, there's an anti-bonding bonding. Now, if you imagine that it's Avogadro's mix of them, where I've got n. Let's let's again. I usually I usually pick on Avogadro. Uh, n is, is Avogadro's number, so you know that's a very large number, 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, and so if I smush that all into a, a centimeter by centimeter by centimeter cube of silicon, I have roughly a mole of silicon in there. And uh, all of those energy levels uh, uh, fractionate into these energy bands. So I get a continuum of energy bands in the conduction band, the valence band. And the 2n states for the 2s and the 6n states for the 2p uh, uh, split equally. So I get four states in the valence band and four states in the conduction band per atom. How many valence electrons do I have on these traditional semiconductors? We have four, right? So, because uh, it's column four in the periodic table. And uh, if it's a 3-5, remember that it's kind of an amalgam of a 3 and a 5, so it's really two fours, right? Um, uh, because they kind of split their difference. So I have four valence electrons per atom. I have four states. So therefore, this is nominally filled. Remember the, t uh, the definition of nominal? Uh, so it's, 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 you know, usually filled. It's usually filled. And unless I perturb it with light, heat, electricity, you know, all these outside forces, they're going to stay there um, and be. So uh, we have the forbidden band gap. Yeah, here's another version of it. And so then what I've always been trying to emphasize is that, um, that most of these are lying along this diagonal. So as the lattice constant gets shorter, the interaction gets bigger, and the splitting gets more dramatic and the band gap blows up. So this is sort of, although Mother Nature will scatter data points, this is kind of linearly varying from inversely of lattice constant band gap. Right. So this is maybe more dramatic. How did the exam go? Okay, good. Um, so here's the, uh, the uh, band gaps, this is a functional lattice constant. So now as you see these other ones being added, you can see that they all, it makes it even more compelling, I would say. Um, now you're getting into uh, uh, band structure, right? Not to be confused, band diagram, band structure. Band structure is energy versus momentum, where momentum is a vector. Bless you. Well, that reminds me, I need to get my flu shot, too. Uh, so if one-dimensional atoms are brought close together, there's the splitting. And uh, this is, I'm trying to show that as you're bringing these together, there's going to be certain wave functions. This might be a little more abstract for the exam, but I, I was trying to, to drag you through that you got some idea why I did this. Because this is a bit too abstract for you, maybe at the 30-30 level. But there's going to be certain allowed and disallowed uh, functions, right? I believe you've accepted this principle of a Fourier series expansion of a, of a step function. You've seen this before, right? Okay. So, 
Therefore, you know that there's certain uh, periods, you know, certain functions that are going to represent this step function using a, a combinations of sines and cosines. And so the, my thought pattern in trying to tr uh, show that uh, preceding this is think of it the same way. There's certain wave functions that are going to support those modes, and there's other certain wave functions that are not going to support those modes. They're going to be suppressed. And, and that's kind of this. This is like a Fourier series expansion of the crystal, crystal diagram, you know, in real space. And then it turns out that these are the allowed wave vectors of that real, so the real space crystal means that this is the solution of that real space in, in, uh, in, in, in energy and momentum space. So I know it's probably hard to wrap your head around you know, energy momentum space, because it's not real, you know, you don't really look at it, but as you start to do the experiments and start to see how these devices and materials respond, you start to accept this more and more. Remember that, that formalism I said, quantum mechanics makes no sense the first time you see it. Oh, you're interrupting me. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it makes no sense the second time you see it, but at least it's familiar. And then the third time, uh, it maybe starts to absorb. Yes, sorry. This is the uh, uh, band structure. So this is showing you, showing the difference between a free particle, which can have a continuum of energy states. So uh, E equals P squared over 2M, right? And so it's continuous parabola. But once you map the wave, wave vectors, uh, energy and wave vectors of, um, uh, onto the crystal, the crystal has boundary conditions just like this has boundary conditions. So there's only certain allowed and, and uh, 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 wave functions that are supported. And so then it fractionates and there's gaps. There's certain modes that are not supported in that superstructure, that, that crystal lattice. Of course, that's lattice dependent. So it depends whether it's silicon, gallium arsenide, um, and so that's why they all have the different, uh, I'll come back to this, Sloan, but they all have different, right, they all look different because a uh, gallium arsenide crystal is different than a silicon crystal, so therefore the band structure looks a lot different. But now let's focus on another key property that is very testable, and that is the curvature here. So if you deconvolve this, you can determine that the curvature is inversely proportional to the effective mass, and the effective mass allows us to do the calculations. Here's the effective mass. The effective mass, m star, is 1 over the curvature of the EK diagram. And then, that allows me, because otherwise, I would have to solve this crystal lattice, the motion of, of particles through this crystal lattice, with all the nauseate, you know, all the, the nasty quantum mechanic details. But by using an effective mass, I can hide the, a lot of the quantum mechanics. And for some simple experiment, uh, some simple calculations, I can use an effective mass, and I can do F equals MA, which is just Newtonian mechanics. Now recognize that M star is uh, really unitless, and so uh, you have to multiply by the mass of an electron, and then you get it in grams. Um, so I'm not sure that's always clear there. Remember, like here, here these are just unitless, right? So it's implied that you're multiplying by the effective by the uh, by the real mass of an electron, and so um, it's usually they usually considered as a as a as a unitless uh, uh, coefficient. Um, so what's going on here? I'm doing a lot of talking. What's going on here? Yes. For the uh, direct, it has, it releases a photon when it drops from covalent to the uh, valence span. And from, then the, from the conduction band. Parts, okay. And then uh, indirect, 
it gives off heat. It has to go to a trapping area first, right? Yeah, or a virtual state. Yeah, this is a trap, but it, like a virtual state, yeah. It's a two-step process. So emphasize the two-step process. And so it could either release a phonon or accept a phonon. Either way is really, so there's kind of two pathways there. Yeah, exactly. So this is less probable. This is a, you know, cause and effect relationship, and this one is kind of what happens. Yes? I thought that these were emitting photons and not phonons. Uh, there's both going on. Okay. Can we go over the difference between a photon and a photon? Yes. So, here's that virtual state. So I'm not going to call it ET as a trap. It's a virtual state. And so this is the gamma valley. This is, uh, what they say, I don't know, this might be L. And so this is uh, phonon. So this is emitted and absorbed. And then this is the, uh, and so then, um, so, here the carrier in the electron would come to here by either absorbing a phonon, so its energy, so by absorbing a phonon, its energy went up a small amount, right? Or it releases a phonon, releases heat. What's your name? Yeah, Connor. Connor. So as Connor said, I need to learn everybody as, as much of you as, as possible. So as Connor said, this is releasing a uh, phonon, so therefore it dropped in energy a, a small amount, and uh, so then it's coming from this lower state. Now, this is not really a radiative emission. This is not likely to release a, a photon. Um, the other one is where that's going to uh, release a photon of energy equal to h nu which is going to e equal EC minus EV, right? The difference in the energies. So this is a photon coming off, which is quantized heat, uh, quantized light. I'm getting me confused. And this is heat, quanti uh, uh, this is a photon, quantized heat. So this is heat. Light. So light doesn't really have uh, much momentum, right? But heat has a lot of momentum. Heat has a lot of vibration. Heat is, vi is quantized vibration. Quantized. Is a photon basically just a vibration? Exactly. Like it's quanti quantized, quantized heat, and heat is a vibration. So is it more like a like mechanical energy, or is it like yes? Energy? Okay. Yeah. As opposed to electromagnetic? Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. So. Professor Richard? Yes. Uh, so, is it always a photon that's emitted in the indirect transition? Or a phonon in the indirect and a photon in the direct? This is more, this is more probable. Okay. And, uh, I mean, uh, it's more probable to do the phonon. Uh, for an indirect, and it's more probable to emit light with a direct, but you can get a mixture of both. I mean, I had a PhD student uh, who all, all he did was look at the light coming out of these kind of indirect band gap materials. And so although this is the more probable, uh, there is still some amount of light, and from there we were able to discern what, the, what was happening inside the material. But that's the more probable. Sometimes I think when I give uh, the uh, most technically correct answer, sometimes it might be a little confusing. I might be giving a little too, too much uh, information, but uh, it's generally heat and, and light, really, too. But, uh, but you can get both. OK, so. Uh,
Yeah, so you can vary these, like as you vary the alloy competition, uh, composition, you can vary the different uh, valleys here and, and, and thereby change it from. So in this particular material, Algas, we can uh, convert this from a uh, uh, direct band gap infrared emitter to a red direct band, uh, band gap, and then it becomes indirect. So, um, I mean, one possible cliche thing for that uh, uh, lab, if we reorganize that lab and have you do an LED, we could have you do a red LED right about here, 35%. Um, which would emit in the red, and we could make it in the shape of a block O if we want to be a little cliche. Uh, so. Okay, so the electrical properties, now uh, moving into the, uh, this, is, this is the idea that we've now built this parking garage, as I've always kind of given the analogy, and that the parking garage is the band gap with the density of states. Now we need to see where the carriers go. So this is where we're trying to find parking spaces for them, right? So here we have the holes, here we have the electrons. This is intrinsic, so therefore there's a one-to-one -one ratio. For every hole that came up, there was an electron. And uh, um, and so here's the donors. So at zero Kelvin, they're frozen. And at a finite temperature, they've released their temperature. They have released their, their electrons. And here's the acceptors. Acceptors accept electrons, right, because of the name. So they accept electrons, creating the holes as a consequence. We can put all these different dopants in. Some are preferred, some are not. Um, what are the conditions? For a, uh, a preferred dopant, what are the what 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 do you say are some of the uh, things you would look for for a, a, an ideal dopant? I don't know if I emphasize this enough. Um, an ideal dopant would be I would want this to be shallow, and. I would want it to be able to, that I can put it in the lattice, right? The, the, the diffusion or implantation or epitaxy that I can put it in. Yes? Like shallow in what way? Um, because of KT, the, the, the thermal yardstick, because this will ionize. I need it to do this. This is the ionization. I need that distance to be... Uh, this energy to be small compared to KT because I need, it, I need the donors to donate. This chromium is not going to donate an electron anytime soon. See how deep that is? It's not shallow like these up here. This is deep. That's going to need a lot of energy to, to release its 0.63. Right. That's that's huge. That's 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 in the in the that's past green. Uh, that's starting to get into that's almost a, into the yellow. I think that's a very high energy uh, difference. So that's not going to release and deliver the electron I need. I need shallow um, uh, donors. I need shallow acceptors because this is how they got got there. This is how they created the free carriers that I need. Okay, so Fermi Dirac statistics is just another way of looking at Pauli exclusion principle. And I'm filling up the energy levels. And as I've told you many times, I tend to like my good coffee. And so I think this is more representative, turning the Fermi Dirac on the side. And then it's like a nice coffee cup, and you're filling with some nice, uh, nice uh, roasted uh, uh, coffee. And you fill it up from the bottom, just like the poor coffee. You pour it from, fill it up from the bottom on up until you get to the rim, and you've filled up, and you run out of space to put your carriers. So this is Fermi Dirac, and if you start to boil it. Then some of the uh, coffee goes off in vapor, and you create some vacancies, right? 
and that's all it is. It's just you're heating it up and you're, you're, you're displacing some of the electrons and moving it to higher energy. So now we're starting to get to really get to somewhere real in the devices. We've got our forbidden band gap. We've got the density of states, which you just have to, at this 30 30 level, accept that they exist. The number of states at which I can put carriers. This is like our parking garage, right? No parking on third and fourth floor. Some, uh, some parking on the second floor, a lot of parking on the first floor. Some parking on the fifth floor, like fourth, fifth, no, sixth, sixth floor, and then a lot of parking up on the seventh floor, right? So here's our Fermi Dirac, our coffee cup. We're about ha halfway up, so therefore we got an equal number of uh, electrons and holes. So this is uh, extrinsic or intrinsic? Intrinsic. Intrinsic. So uh, intrinsic is no intentional impurities. Extrinsic is intentionally doped. Charge neutrality equation. So therefore, um, and here's the Fermi level, probability of occupancy of 50%. And so you fill it up with electron, it becomes electron rich. If, you, if it's doped to then uh, into donors, it becomes hole rich if you fill it up with the acceptors. And then this is what I really care about, right? This is, these are a means to an end. This is telling me where the Fermi Dirac goes up and down based on the uh, carrier statistics. The density of states actually doesn't change. If you notice, this is the same, right? This is the same semiconductor, right? I haven't changed the semiconductor. So if you notice, this is the same. These two are the same as the, this and this. The only thing that's shifting is the Fermi Dirac, because that's been depending upon the uh, doping. So this is intrinsic, this is n-type, this is p-type, and the electron becomes electron rich if it's n-type. So negative, n for n, uh, n, n for negative, so it's, it becomes very electron rich. P-type for positive, uh, so it becomes very hole rich. Right? But because of the charge neutrality equation, it's, it's becoming hole rich at the expense of the electrons, right? So that we're going to later, as we get into device physics, this will become the majority carrier, and this is the minority carrier. And that's the end of that. And what else do we have? Now, we've got all that charge in there. And now we can actually move it around and make current and have some fun. And so this is the final understanding before we can actually make devices. So again, the average energy, the thermal yardstick as I like to call it, is 26 milli electron volts. And so compared to the band gap of germanium, band gap of silicon, band gap of gallium arsenide, it's small. So therefore, very few carriers can jump the forbidden band gap at room temperature unless you give it a donor level, an acceptor level, or a trap level. So um, this is the review of what we had before. So there's another declaration of the density of states. Um, so you can see how it's a small, small number at the bottom, and it gets uh, parabolically larger as you go deeper into the bands. And we've seen this before, we've seen that before. So then the electron concentration, and again, you're not going to, other than knowing this equation, uh, the interrelationships, you're not going to have to uh, do these kind of derivations on the, uh, on the midterm. Um, how, how are you doing with that one homework problem, looking at the EI level? Have you gotten that far, the homework problem? There's one, one homework problem that's telling you where is EI relative to the band gap? You haven't even started the homework, did you? 
You're going to start the homework this weekend. That's what that means. You, you know, all these blank faces. Okay. Okay, now I know that you've been outed. Yes. Um, going back to the last slide, for the charge neutrality equation, what does Ni represent? The intrinsic carry concentration. Okay. It is not some sort of electron concentration. It's both. It's, it's this. The intrinsic carry concentration. So what is the... We know that for every elect, if, it, if it's not doped, this is not doped, this is all pure silicon. Pure, un, unadulterated silicon, right? So if I have room temperature, I have some KT, I have some thermal yardstick, so I have some probability that some electrons can jump up to the conduction band, creating holes, right? But that's going to happen in a one-to-one -one ratio, right? going to happen in a one-to-one -one ratio? Yes. Okay. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you asked the question. So intrinsic carry concentration is looking at, uh, uh, it's counting N, uh, it's using N, right, N sub I, but really we could say P sub I because the number of electrons and the number of holes are equal to each other, right? That's by definition the intrinsic. So we just refer to it as n sub i. So, but but you're, you're right. I mean, it's it's really the electrons and the holes, but they're equal. It's intrinsic. So, if you follow that, then uh, you go through, and so if n sub d, the donor density in this particular example is 10 to the 17, you assume full ionization. EI is usually EG over 2, but the homework problem you haven't even started, you're going to have to find out where the deviation is from that by going back to first principles. And then, uh, so then the difference, and you find out from this that it ends up being right there, the Fermi level. That's the watermark level that tells you how electron rich it is. And so. Yeah, so here's, here's a maybe a, a magnified view really showing those density of states. So this is a busy diagram because it's trying to show all those graphs on top of each other. Uh, so here's the Fermi function on top of the density of states function on top of the uh, band, band, band gap on top of the carrier density. So it's really trying to show four things all on top of each other. Uh, I like it, but it might be confusing to you. I don't know. And then if it's uh, got that phosphorus dopant, the donor, it donates an electron right there. So the donor's uh, energetically right there, donates an electron. And so then I have, uh, it's electron rich. And then I have my sail, right, this, this sail uh, showing the representation of where the carriers are. And what's the, what's the boundary condition on the, uh, on the sail at the bottom? What's, what's the rate limiting step, if you will, the boundary condition on the bottom? It's the density of states, right? It's just following that same contour, the density of states. And what's the, uh, what's the rate limiting step on the top? What's, what's causing that contour? It's the Fermi Dirac statistics, right? So we're running out of carriers at the higher energies. Because remember, they're all packed down at the bottom, right? All like Susan principle. You start filling from the bottom and fill up to the top. It's your coffee, coffee mug analogy. Okay, and so the holes uh, here. It's the same thing, but you just have to stand on your head. It's the Poseidon adventure. Anybody see the Poseidon adventure? No? Well, it's a classic from the 80s, uh, where everybody's trying to go to the top of the ship, but the ship rolled over, and so only a group, a handful of about a dozen people know to go to the bottom of the ship, which is the top, and they're the only ones that get rescued. It's a classic movie. It's back when those, those, uh, those disaster movies of the 80s. Um, so 
Yeah, so here's the donors donating and the acceptors accepting. And temperature dependence. So this is uh, unfortunately the Alania left. But here's the temperature dependence of N sub I showing. And here's the intrinsic carry concentration. So now you see the temperature dependence of them. And so the hotter it gets, the more carriers jump the forbidden band gap. Right. So I don't think I've ever explicitly drawn this, but let me do it this time. <coughs> I just want to make this painfully clear. So if you gap on the exam, it's not my fault. Let's assume this is germanium, 0 0.8 EV. So at KT, I'm going to have you know, quite a lot of these guys maybe jumping. Right. So my intrinsic carry concentration is counting the number of electrons and the number of holes, so I get 10 to the 13. But what if I have silicon 1.1 electron volts then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to do about four of these. So I'm going to have, you know, half as many. And then if I do gallium arsenide at, at uh, EG equals 1.42, I might get one of these, right? So it's because this is small, but KT, there's, they can hop. Right, KT is, yes, question. What does KT mean? I just KT is the average energy in, this, in the system. It's the average thermal energy. So any, any time uh, the energy is going to be Boltzmann constant times uh, temperature. So same temperature. But you can see the probability of carry 